Okay, so we are back in Columbus, and right now it is about 10 a.m., and I'm going to do a few apartment tours here. Okay, so quick housing update. I just toured maybe like three places right now. Three of them were two-bedroom units. One of them was a one-bedroom, but on the same street. Very, very cute side street. Yeah, the guy was really nice and basically told me that the last place that we saw that he's not going to show it the rest of this weekend, so I feel like we got some really good options. Yeah, I saw some Marvin Gaye in there. Yeah. Give me a little wave. Perfect. More candid. That's I love real. that. It's like the actual experience. Yeah. It's like when like people have disposable cameras. These tours for apartments earlier, and then I went to a cafe and ended up having a long talk with my friend about grad school and other opportunities and things, and I just had lunch, and now I'm about to hop on a call with my agent. Um, I'm a little tired. I feel like I could have slept better, but I think this call is going to go well, so I'll update you after. I did my call with my agent, and it went really well. Basically, we talked about the ideas that I have for my novel and how revisions are going, and my goal right now is to finish revisions by the end of the month. So that gives me about 20 days and change. And then the other update was talking about the collection of essays idea that I have and where I kind of see my drafting for that going and what's next for it. So it was a pretty good call. Date, the date is Tuesday, September 12th, 10 09 AM. Right now I am sitting down and doing some work. I am trying to finish an essay that I have to turn in in a few days. It's about Kawasi Balagoon, who is a famous revolutionary with the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army. Really great example of a bisexual activist who was really about um, guerrilla warfare and liberatory black politics and he did a lot of amazing work so it's been really really cool researching him and i think it's going to fold into a lot of the other essay writing that i'm trying to do over the next few months um, so i need to do that and work on that today but in about an hour and a half i'm doing another apartment tour here in columbus nearby it's in clintonville it's pretty reasonably priced it's about 900 and I'm curious to see it because I feel like it's in a good neighborhood. The street is really cute. It's a good price. I'm just hoping that the place is vibey and homey and not just old. But I also am touring another place tomorrow and another place on Thursday, Wednesday. So yeah, the house hunting is going good. I feel really all over the place in a lot of ways, but coming back to Ohio is really calming and I'm just really kind of allowing myself to feel at ease, do the work I need to do and just kind of take everything day by day, moment by moment, um, but I really want to finish this essay today. So the same cafe I was at yesterday to do some work with another friend and yeah I mean so far I've gotten a good maybe four paragraphs of my essay written I've been doing a lot of research but I've got a good amount of research done I think I've probably written a good 400 words out of the thousand that I need so I'm gonna go to this cafe sit down and try and finish more of this work and maybe look up some applications and grants and other things that I can apply to friend's place and I did a good, good amount of work at the cafe. Um, I have pretty much finished most of the essay that I was working on and I feel like if I just looked at it again in the morning and did like a half an hour of work on it, it would basically be done. Um, part of me is wondering if I need to maybe find one or two outside source interviews but I'll maybe see what the editor thinks about that when I send off the draft. Okay, so right now it is the next day and I am, it's around 9 a.m. I woke up, I'm sitting down and I'm going to finish the article that I have been writing for the past day or two. It's basically about this black revolutionary Kwasi Balagoon and 
one thing that I'm kind of adding to it now is adding some kind of current cultural context, which is that there has been a rise of anti-LGBTQIA legislation, violence. Um, Ashley Burton is a black trans woman that was recently shot and killed in Atlanta. O'Shea Sibley was a gay black man killed in a gas station in New York um, this summer. So I'm kind of relating these contemporary violences to kind of raise Kawasi Balagoon's name as an example of how black, queer, and trans people can look at how we can transform our worlds. Um, and this is kind of on a topic that I really want to write a lot about, which is this notion of revisiting black and queer self-defense because I think in an age where Black Lives Matter has moved through our spaces where George Floyd protests have happened, where the pandemic has happened, we've seen mutual aid happen and be possible. And we've also seen these things be peeled back. We've also seen the changes in the ways that police are operating, what stopped Cop City in Atlanta, and there's being this Cop City proposed in Cleveland. And I just think there is a precedent being set that journalists, writers, activists, organizers, revolutionaries need to be aware of, which is how do we continue to defend ourselves? How do we defend ourselves when other people won't defend us? How do we defend ourselves when other people in our own community won't defend us? And these are all questions that I want to dive into and read more about, and it's definitely maybe going to show up in um, an essay that I want to write. I'm still trying to pitch stuff for LGBTQ History Month. It's been kind of difficult, but maybe that'll be on the agenda today. But also today I have two apartment tours and I'm also doing a call for an online class that I have that's starting up in a few days. So it's kind of a busy day and I'm maybe gonna hang out with friends later. We'll see. Let's get to work. dealt into different issues that are important to me as a child of Jamaican immigrants. And I want to read a particular section in the book. Um, this is around page 210. It's in a chapter where I go to Stenning Rock, North Dakota, to oppose the Dakota Access Pipeline with a bunch of other water protectors. For those that don't know, the Dakota Access Pipeline was a pipeline being built through sacred indigenous land around 2016, and there's a huge movement around it. And this is from the section when I am leaving Stenning Rock for the first time. I'm talking to a woman giving me a ride, and I'm kind of ruminating on sort of travel emotion that has been hard for me to name. So here we are, page 210. As she spoke, I sank further into my seat and sometimes looked out at the scenery, turning from flat roadsides to skyscrapers to woodsy rural groves. Eventually, we reached the topic of why I'd left my state to join a movement so far away. In a way, I couldn't explain it all, but I could connect my anger to loss, to my loss, which was low-key amorphous and jagged. I don't know, I said fearful that I might fall asleep, and also because some other strange dream was edging towards me. Part of me looks at all of these places that I'm going to and the places I've been. I enjoy it, I love it, and I feel grateful and I'm glad to push myself, but I get this weird feeling. Weird feeling, she says. It was raining, and she white knuckled the steering wheel. I couldn't recall what state we were in, but it was late. The highways had cleared significantly. Now there were only trucks in the sky unable to birth any stars. The world beyond us was frozen. In a way, we were stateless, and this statelessness took me back to months before, when my late night flight arrived to Big Sky, Montana. After grabbing my bags from the carousel, I stepped outside to see no cars. I sighed, realizing that suddenly I had not one but two friends who had failed to pick me up from the airport. 
owe me fifty dollars in a debt phone, I realized I didn't have to take I didn't have a way to take a taxi to call any of the team for a hotel room for the night. Under the darkened sky, I walked out to the wide grass field in front of the airport, set my sleeping bag down, and fell asleep. I awoke soaked in dew and marveled at the orange and fuchsia morning sky. Now back in the car with Whitney as we barreled down the highway, I told the truth. I wish I could take people with me. I wish I could reach back and yank every single person I've cared about to see the waterfall or even the sky at night in the camp. I hadn't seen that many stars in a while. Sometimes it feels like I'm carrying this whole world of people whose world I want to change, whose world I hope would change if they came with me. I wish there was a name for that feeling. And so this is one of the many moments in the book where I feel like I reached a place of writing that I hadn't really reached before. Um, I think travel can be amazing, it can be a privilege, it can also be a way for you to politically and culturally connect with people in other places, but it can also be extremely lonely if you aren't from a background where people in your community or your family travel in the same way. And I don't really have a name for this feeling yet, but there is a feeling of loneliness that's particular to the different kinds of travel that I've done. So um, if you want to read more, check out my book. It's in the link in my bio. It's out in hardcover, paperback. I'm doing one or two book events this week. Uh, you can check it all out in the link in my Um, I have been hanging out in, Ath in Columbus the past few days, hanging out, going out, turning up. Last night I went to like a dance night here. It was really fun, talked to a lot of people. I feel like coming back has really reawakened and ignited some of how I process like, not even social anxiety, but social existentialism, if that makes sense. Like coming back, it's been very interesting to kind of go out, run into people. Um, and I don't know, maybe this is just sort of a weird tangent but I feel like I'm someone where I can't really control my facial expressions like last night I I don't know like sometimes when I see people I haven't seen in a while it's not that I'm just pleased to see them sometimes I'm just like it surprises me and so I look kind of confused like there's this one person I ran into and I was like oh you're here but he was kind of like oh why are you looking at me like that and I'm just thinking I'm surprised to see you here it's not like I, this isn't a look of displeasure um so I've just been vibing and yesterday I watched um Judas and the Black Messiah with my friend that I'm planning a podcast with and it was very interesting to watch that movie and if you've seen that movie let me know what you think of it but I think watching it again it gave me a lot of questions about the utility of representing black radical histories on a storytelling level and whether or not and what are the implications of turning something that is real historical and tragic and is still happening today which is like the state targeting and killing activists what are the implications of turning that into something that's supposed to be like cinematic and shiny and cool and interesting like some part of that art making process to me feels a little weird like maybe a little inauthentic um like i thought the actors did a great job i thought it was very moving but on some level i was just like oh is this enough or i i don't know i i think i have this larger question about is art manipulation is it honest manipulation is it authentic manipulation when you are making art that represents a certain history or past and i feel like most people don't really understand the complexity of the black panther party so what's the point of making a movie like is it to elicit interest or is it to portray a more honest depiction of who they are and i feel like i'm asking questions about the implications of function when i think people just make art because stories are dynamic and interesting and it doesn't have to be all this other stuff. I don't know, I just think there's certain contradictions that are interesting to me, and I like thinking about it. Um, but what's on the agenda for today? It's Sunday. Basically, over this week, 
I am going back to Cleveland, so I need to book a ticket to go back to Cleveland because I'm doing a author talk with Incubator of Cleveland, which is a part of Literary Cleveland. <laughs> and so I need to book that. I'm staying with my friend. Send out an email to students of my class today or tomorrow. I maybe need to look at the papers I need to grade this week. But really today, I need to work on my novel and try to get to the end of Act 1, which is like two chapters of work, which is why I made coffee. I'm trying to like get settled comfortable. Okay, so I'm sitting here taking notes, and it's honestly fascinating how when you're working on revising something, all it takes is shifting one tool or one way that you kind of process things, and it'll just kind of open up a whole new world. And I guess I'd be missed in terms of like, literally, I just folded up some paper. And for me, I'm a verbal plotter. Like, I like to talk things through, but I also like to write things out. And even now, like, there's a side character that I've added to this book, and I'm kind of insecure about how he's being portrayed like I think he needs to come across more dynamically or like there needs to be more scene work with him and I literally just wrote how can blank character's mother be visualized and I'm noting all these different areas in the story where I could potentially add a scene or I need to work through because basically this is a manipulative character so there's his above ground kind of emotion or motivation and what he's expressing and then there's the underground motivation and what I'm dealing with is how do you write a character in an engaging way who's also keeping secrets and how do you not make the secret super obvious but allude to it do you know what i mean if you have any tips on that let me know because that's what i'm trying to figure out but yeah i'm literally just writing down my notes here and sitting with my coffee and getting to work on this i'm glad i'm doing this today honestly i and also i've sent emails to my students i responded to some other emails i booked my tickets to go to Cleveland, um, so my week is pretty much plotted out, and yeah, I was just kind of texting some friends and figuring out who I want to hang out with. I don't know what I want to do later today. I don't know if I want to go out, go to a bar, hang out, or see if there's another friend that I can just watch a movie with. I kind of just want to chill. Can you tell that I'm kind of like... <laughs> Wait, what? Tell us who you are. Oh, I'm Jordan. Prince's uh, future roommate. What? And this guy who was like... He is just like on screen responsibility. opens <laughs> early, has food, so it's like what nomadism means to me now that I'm kind of entering a period of not knowing exactly what the next three or six or nine or ten months or a year will look like. Um I think in my early twenties I viewed it as like a, a right of getting experience and going out into the world and being bold and savoring my youth and I don't want to attach it to youth anymore. I don't want to attach it to the way I look or the way my body feels. I more want to attach it to this idea that I want to show up in the world in a way that is curious. I want to be bold in my convictions. I want to fiercely de defend my independence and I want to be flexible enough to go where life takes me or to take myself where I want to go in life. Um, and I think those are all skills that we can carry with us. And although I left Columbus with all these ideals and I moved to New York and I had some of those ideals shift around and now I'm back, I do feel like the core self that I have is strengthening. Like no matter where I go, I'm gonna be caring about social justice. I'm gonna be looking for community. I'm gonna be making art. And I'm also gonna be endlessly curious. Like I don't think, at this point in my life, there's anywhere I could see myself living, and I move there, and I'm like, oh, this is my forever place. Even moving to New York, I liked it, I loved it, but I also saw myself not wanting to live there much longer past 30, because I haven't really lived abroad yet, and that's an experience that I deeply, deeply, deeply want to experience and have. But the other side of me, which is why cognitive dissonance is a thing, is also saying, you do want stability. You do want to date and have a partner and have a house and start 
settling down in certain ways but i also feel like there's so much more life to experience there's so many places to go so many people to meet like i could see myself falling in love abroad again i could see myself living in another country i could see myself going to grad school somewhere so we are at a bar in cleveland now and i realized i took an uber to uh, the wrong like a bar that's further away from where my friend lives but hey we're here it's happy hour Break down all the lights, let me hold you close I'm full of loose ends, will you be my road? Tables, you can buy books The room where my talk is, it's a big auditorium It's a Part of it that was most challenging. Sister. 